And now we're going to have Carrie, our program chair, to introduce tonight's speaker. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming. I have the privilege to uh, announce Dr. Alan Titus. So Dr. Alan Titus is a paleontologist for the Bureau of Land Management's Perea River District and former monument paleontologist for Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, a position he served in for 20 years. He received his undergraduate degree from UNLV, a master's of science degree from the University of Arkansas, and his doctoral degree from Washington State University. As monument paleontologist, Dr. Titus helped get the Kaparowitz Basin Project Basin Project established in co collaboration with the Natural History Museum of Utah and later the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And the Utah Geological Survey. And the Utah Geological Survey. <laughs> <laughs> um, this partnership, which is still ongoing, has resulted in the discovery of at least 20 new species of dinosaurs in the Kaparowitz Plateau region, making it one of the true hotbeds of dinosaur paleontology in the world. In 2013, the centrosaurine dinosaur Nasutoceratops titusi was named after him in honor which he considers one of the highlights of his career. Dr. Titus resides in Kanab, Utah, where he can also be found playing his guitar, riding his bicycle, or hiking amongst the beauty of the Red Rock Canyons. Without further ado, this is Dr. Alan Titus. Woo! All right. Um, thank you very much, Carrie. That was a wonderful introduction. And I, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us tonight. And I especially want to thank you, FOP, for hosting this meeting and then giving me the invitation uh, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to speak to all of you, and and um, I'm really happy for the opportunity. All right. Well, um, before I uh, dive into the the uh, specifics of my talk, I do want to recognize that what I'm bringing you tonight is not just my work alone. This has been the result of a collaborative effort, um, both with other BLM staff, uh, including Katja Canole, a lab manager here at uh, the Grand Staircase Paleo Lab along with um, Joe Sertich at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, Dr. Ian Glasspool, um, Field Museum, uh, Dr. Selena Suarez and Daigo Yamamura from the University of Arkansas and uh, Eric Roberts from James Cook University, Australia helped us out with some of the stratigraphy. So it's a joint project and um, as a, as a preliminary comment, uh, I just wanna let you know that the manuscript that I submitted to Peer J last year on this very topic that I'm talking about was accepted for publication earlier in February, and I'm expecting um, galley, you know, layout proofs uh, by the end of next week. So I'm really excited. This this will actually be in print here before too long. I mean, within weeks rather than months now. So um, you'll be able to read all the technical gory details in our. 65 page manuscript <laughs> uh, soon, hopefully. And it's open access, so you don't have to pay. There's no pay paywalls to get through. Okay, so with that, I'm going to proceed. So large theropod bone beds in general are a rare phenomenon globally. There are a handful of very famous well-known examples including the Cleveland Lloyd quarry a part of which is pictured here which was uh, a trap for Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus both um, studies have concluded that this is probably some sort of attritional trap or uh, accumulation of individuals over time although the exact mechanism for doing that uh, is still debated and I'm voting for poison, Jim. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but in general, these large theropod uh, bone beds are, are unusual. They're, they're sort of an, an exception. You know, large ornithischian bone beds are really not all that common, but large theropod dinosaur bone beds are, are rather un, unusual. Um, there's another example, <clears throat> the, the U. tyrannus walleye, site in uh, in China in the Yijian formation uh, about 125 million years old um, near the Baremian Aptian boundary where we have two adult individuals laid out tail to tail uh, relatively complete showing soft tissue preservation but whatever whatever brought these two animals together killed two adults uh, 
and put them in the same place. So uh, an example of a logger stot with two large theropods. These are seven meter long individuals. And then there's this locality. This is Dry Island Buffalo Jump in Alberta, Canada, where uh, the remains of at least 12 Albertosaurus sarcophagus were excavated from the Horseshoe Canyon formation uh, by multiple crews over the years, including uh, teams led by Dr. Phil Curry, one of the most famous uh, large theropod specialists. Here he is holding a uh, Albertosaurus jaw from the site. Um, this site's very unusual in that it, it was concluded after exhaustive study that these animals, uh, the, the site and the, uh, the deposit animals represents a mass kill rather than an attritional assemblage that accumulated over a longer period of time, that they were taken out on a single flood event and that the range of ages represented by the assemblage uh, would suggest that this was some sort of gregarious or social group. Um, this has not been without controversy. And uh, I hope that um, tonight we can look at some of the questions surrounding, you know, how do you prove gregariousness or social behavior out of the fossil record and maybe make some conclusions of our own about this site I'll be referring to tonight uh, called the Rainbows and Unicorns Tyrannosaur site. So Phil had challenged this notion that these large tyrannosaur dinosaurs, here's T-Rex in the Maastrichtian eyeing some Edmontosaurus, um, that they were, didn't have the brain power or uh, the inclination to gather socially or hunt socially or develop hierarchical groups. Um, and that has been fairly controversial. You know, there are a number of people still saying that just flat out T-Rex would not have had the brain power to organize a complex hierarchical uh, group. Um, I've heard uh, Thomas Carr state that explicitly to me at uh, SVP meetings. So there are a lot of skeptics that these animals could organize into packs and behave like wolves or lions. Um, historically, they've been depicted as lone uh, hunters or perhaps uh, maybe in pairs. So that brings us to the discovery in 2014 uh, of a site uh, in the interior of the Kaparowitz Plateau inside Grand Staircase Susquehanna National Monument where there were multiple tyrannosaurs uh, exposed at the surface when we got to the site. Um, the site's official number 14 UTKA8 uh, is, is sort of bland. Uh, so later on, we came up with another name for it, which I'll explain later. But um, 14 UTKA8 was discovered quite serendipitously because a crew of volunteers had to cancel um, assisting us with another dig. So there we were without our expected volunteer crews. Um, we decided to take a turtle specialist named Mike Cannell over to a little butte about 200 yards off a road to show him some Neuronchylus turtle fragments. These are large, you know, three foot diameter turtle shells that we had seen earlier weathering out of the south side of this small butte. Well, the big rainstorm that had prevented our volunteers from coming out had also recently exposed tyrannosaur bones that we had not seen at the site previously. This is a large uh, pedal phalanx, a large uh, hind foot toe segment that was uh, exposed within the first few minutes of brushing at the site. The discovery bone actually was an astragalus, an ankle bone, but uh, we brushed and within several minutes exposed not just this, but literally dozens of other elements. There's caudal bones and uh, toe bones and a shattered juvenile femur in this picture right here. You'll notice that it was really deeply weathered. This is essentially soil with bone fragments floating in it. The, the rock has long since weathered into little, little blocks and, and dirt. Um, but we, we recovered all this loose material in the soil and then got down into good rock and started finding amazing, amazing fossils. <clears throat> Excavation has been ongoing every year since, except for uh, last year, we gave the site a break to focus on two new Tyrannosaur sites. But uh, we pulled 
tons of bones out of this site and uh, that's up to about 1300 mapped elements. We estimate the extent of the site to be about eight tenths of an acre of bone, you know, good solid bone bed uh, for that extent. And then sort of lower density bones spreading out in all directions uh, for several hundred meters. In fact, it may be part of a larger bone horizon that goes on for some distance. The site has been so amazing and has yielded such diversity that um, we were going on pretty extensively about it early. You know, we were saying, oh, this is the most amazing site we've ever found, maybe that we'll ever find. And uh, one of uh, one of my former lab managers, who was also a little skeptical about my claim, said, uh, you know, we all know with Alan, everything's rainbows and unicorns. Uh, what's this site really like? And that name stuck. So uh, I have to pay homage to Tyler Berthesell and give him credit. But uh, his, his skepticism led to the site being nicknamed the Rainbows and Unicorns Tyrannosaur site. All right, well, let's get into the site itself. Look at some of the details of who, what, where, when, why, and all of that. Uh, starting with the context of, of the geology of the site. <clears throat> it's located in the northwestern portion of the Kaparowitz Plateau, deep within the Kaparowitz subunit of Grand Staircase Escalani National Monument. Uh, not far off of a very well-traveled road, so I'm I'm not inclined to give out specific locational details. Uh, I wouldn't normally anyway, but this is an especially sensitive site and it's especially accessible. So I'm, the, the star covers a, a lot of ground and good luck finding it based on this map. But anyways, uh, it's, it's up in the northwest corner within the Kaparowitz Formation, which is the youngest and highest of the really fossiliferous Cretaceous formations in the Kaparowitz region. Uh, the next unit up is the Canaan Peak, and we now know that that's probably in part still Cretaceous in age, but it's not very fossiliferous. So the, the Kaparowitz formation is the top of the really good fossil bearing sequence inside the monument. Um, we wanted to know specifics on how old this site probably was. We didn't have an ash or anything to directly date it, so we had to use some indirect methods. So that's where Eric Roberts' expertise came in. I had him measure a, a section starting at the top of the wall weep. Actually, he and I did this together. Um, and we came up with uh, 138 and a half meters above the base of the Kaparowitz, just up into what is called the informal middle mudstone unit. So we're, we're really low in this middle mudstone unit, which is the big fossil producer within the Kaparowitz. I mean, most of the animals you've heard of from the Kaparowitz, like Cosmoceratops, Nasuto, Utah Ceratops, Teratophonius, um, Acanocephalus, the Ankylosaur, they're all from this middle unit, the type specimens. But it's pretty low. And uh, we don't actually have good ashes really close to date, but extrapolating, counting down and, and averaging sediment rates and all of that, we kind of guesstimate that we're looking at about 76.42 million uh, for the site itself. Um, in general, the formation represents river and floodplain deposits. And when you look at the details of the site, you see both. And we'll get into that uh, here in a second. Um, Anything else I wanted to say about the Kaparowitz formation? No. Okay, so moving right along to the site details then, when you blow up the, the stratigraphy of the site or the layers of sediment uh, that we see, there's clearly two different sequences of events or two different stories told by the package of sediments immediately above and below the bones. So let's focus on the lower package first. And that's a series of sand at the bottom overlain by fining sand, sand getting smaller in grain size up into uh, what is essentially a clay deposit, a very fine grain unit called a mudstone. So unit one is what we call a fining upward sequence. It's grading from sand to fine sand into finally mud. And Situations like that where indicate that you're decreasing energy in a water system. So you're, you've got water lane sediments, the unit at the bottom here labeled number one out of three, 
uh, represents actually fairly high flow of water, probably within the channel of a, of a river, like a sandbar. Two represents getting on the margin maybe of that river system and three is still standing water. So you, you essentially have a river transitioning into a standing body of water. Okay, we did find turtle shell and gastropods and other aquatic creatures preserved in unit three. Um, indicating that it was in fact a water environment, semi, at least semi-permanent and inhabited by aquatic creatures. Now, unit three is also, and unit two, is also filled with all these funny little white blobs that you can see in the top left uh, photo of the rock specimens. And it turns out those white blobs are actually caliche balls. They're little blobs of calcium carbonate that formed within the soil after whatever water body dried out um, and, uh, and it started to turn into a soil. So you have the history of standing body of water and then a drying episode, which led to the formation of these little calcium carbonate balls. And then we can see penetration of roots into that as well. And I'll have a photo of one of those later. So you see that it's a gradual drying out in the evolution of this particular lake. So you see abandonment of a river, establishment of a, of a body of water, and then it dries out, it gets colonized by plants and soil formation starts and calcium carbonate starts to grow down in what we call the sea horizon, okay, near the water table. Um, and so we're probably looking initially at a system like this. You've got a, a section of a river that's been cut off from the main body of a river. This is what we refer to as an abandoned channel or an oxbow. And so you have the former river sediments, uh, the, the sandbars on the bottom of the sequence. But as soon as it gets cut off from the river, the type of sediment that is accumulating in there changes and it goes from coarse grain to, to fine grain clay and mud. And uh, that, that's our best guesstimate on what that sequence from uh, the bottom represents, okay? Looking at the top sequence, um, which is separated from the bottom sequence by a very rough uneven surface that indicates erosion, uh, it looks like you're now back into a river channel. You know, you're back to the same kind of sandstones that you see down at the bottom of the sequence that represent sandbars. And it looks like that rough surface that's the boundary between the lower and upper sequences represents an erosional event in which the arm of a river actually chewed its way through these former lake sediments and churned them up and redeposited them. And the big question was, is that the story of the bones? Were the bones all there in unit three and got churned up? Or were they brought in from various other places and deposited at the same time as the churning of the former lake? So did these bones used to reside in the former lake or were they brought in from somewhere else and just deposited with the churned up lake sediments? We needed to establish a case to try to show whether these tyrannosaurs all died at the same time or were washed in from various places. But it's tricky because the original context for the burial of all of these bones has, has been destroyed. I mean, you're assuming that uh, they, they, were, they were somewhere else buried in another context and now they've been eroded out or washed downstream. And so how do you go about gleaning the site history of a site that for all practical purposes doesn't really exist anymore. And I know this is a problem because the reviewers kept pointing it out to us during our review. And we kept saying with certainty, oh, these fossils all came from this site. And they kept saying, you can't prove that. And we kept going back and, and looking at it from different angles and we finally did prove it. And I'll show you, show you that later. Okay, so how we go about learning all we can from a site that for all intents and purposes, doesn't even exist anymore in its primary context. So think about this, here's our new depositional setting for the bones inside the arm of 
an active river channel. So you've transitioned from an abandoned river through a lake back into an active channel. And what are some of the features that we see in that upper sequence uh, and lower sequence that help us clarify this story? Well, these are a series of geology features at the site that were especially uh, helpful in helping us determine the site history. A is a pavement of fish scales, especially gar, uh, Lepososteus. So this is a, a, like a needle nose gar or a, a modern short, short face gar. And uh, there were literally pavements of these fish scales at the contact with the bottom of uh, sequence two, you know, unit, we call it unit four with the underlying unit three. So there was like a lag. It was like placer gold being um, sorted out and these fish scales, which are heavy and, uh, and uh, sort of resist erosion were just smeared all over that erosional surface with the, um, the overlying rocks. So, some, it indicates there was a mass mortality or a large amount of dead fish in the, in the region. B uh, illustrates the uneven topography that you see at the contact between the overlying units in the second sequence of the, the river channel with the underlying units of the, the abandoned lake meander, so, <clears throat> or lake uh, channel meander. So you see these swales, these sort of rises, and then you see these little troughs created adjacent to the rises that look like giant drapery folds or flutes. And these had a definite trend, parallel trend to them. And I'll show that in a map here in a second. You'll see that they, they probably indicate a direction of current flow during the erosion and uh, emplacement of the second sequence. Moving down to C, this was kind of interesting. Uh, a, a large amount of charcoal was found in units four and five. And that uh, at first led us down the path of maybe a fire triggered this mass mortality in the Tyrannosaurus. Maybe they were trying to get away from a forest fire. Um, D is unit three showing a fairly substantial root penetration down below a jacket there. Um, and so these are vertically oriented in situ roots that document the colonization of this former lake bottom by plants at about the same time probably that those little white blobs are forming. And then maybe some of the most telling evidence that we found were actually within the Tyrannosaur bones themselves. E shows calcium carbonate deposits that had accreted inside the bones. On the left there, um, you see calcium carbonate that had started to fill up the pore spaces within the centra or in the disc of a tyrannosaur vertebrae and it didn't quite solidify it to the point where it was rigid and when it was later compacted it shattered and exposed all that carbonate on the inside and then there's also um, little blobs of carbonate exposed to the right up at the top so so that caliche was actually growing inside the tyrannosaur bones and in our minds tied the tyrannosaur bones to the underlying unit three giving us a context for them. Then moving on to F, we see that same fine grain green clay that's so characteristic of unit three. So now, you know, once we made these observations, we were certain that the tyrannosaur bones and probably the mass, the, the bulk of the fossil material from the site had been derived from unit three or a similar overlying unit. But the reviewers kept telling us we couldn't prove it. You can't prove that. These could still be washed in from somewhere else. Okay, well, let's see. Um, next, I'm gonna show you the quarry map, just to give you a, an idea of the spatial distribution of all of these bones. And uh, north is to the top. And you'll see that there are spatial groupings within each taxonomic group. So for instance, the teratophonius or tyrannosaur bones are clustered sort of in a left up, uh, up to the left trend from the letter B. There was a big Tyrannosaur skull there just to the left of the B. And then there's a big blotch of red up to the upper left. And then if you look just to the left of the A, 
that's uh, a big smear, if you will, of Dinosuchus bones, which is a, a giant alligatoroid that we found uh, a fairly complete specimen of. And then if you go down below the bee, down towards the bottom center of the map grid, um, there's a smear of big green turtle shell fragments which belong to uh, a single neuronchyla specimen from what we could tell. So, you know, you have these individual animals that are being smeared in this preferred direction. Well, it just so happens that the direction that they seem to be smeared across is parallel to those troughs and ridges that we see that we were able to map through the quarry. So it's no coincidence. Um, those are definitely current indicators. And when you do an analysis on the orientation of the bones, which is shown down on the bottom right, there's a clear trend, um, a sort of 300 degree northwest southeast uh, predominant orientation with a secondary orientation 90 degrees to that. And that's very typical of bones that have had at least some limited transport by moving water. You tend to orient bones that have a heavy end to them parallel to the currents and bones that are sort of equally weighted across their entire lengths, uh, sort of perpendicular to currents. So there is some current involved in the final deposition of all of this material. And that was an important clue. Um, looking at the faunal makeup itself, it was a staggering diversity. And that's one of the reasons we nicknamed it the Rainbow and Unicorns Quarry, because there's so much fossil diversity represented in this one site. Um, everything from invertebrates, there's a, uh, a viviparid uh, gastropod, freshwater gastropod at the top there, along with the little fingernail sized unionid bivalve. And that's all the bigger those bivalves got, which also turned out to be kind of important. Um, and then B is an articulated series of uh, teleos fish vertebrae. Um, C illustrates remains of four different meter long neuronchylus turtle shells. The two on the upper right are actually complete, perfectly complete carapace plastrons. The two on the lower left are partials, but um, you know we're probably looking at a half dozen really good nearly complete shells from the site excavated so far and uh, the remains of several others. So, you know, multiple, maybe a 10 or a dozen large neuronchylus, along with six other turtle taxa, including species of soft shells, the trinicids, and um, other baenids like um, something called denizenomies. So a fairly robust, diverse turtle assemblage from a single site. And then there's this freak of a turtle illustrated uh, in D, that's just the lower jaw of a ginormous turtle that we didn't know what to do with at first. But after some reading and, and digging around, we realized this was related to sea turtles. It was related to contemporary sea turtles. So we, we were wondering what it was doing in what was presumably a freshwater lake, you know, 50 miles upstream. Um, we're talking about a ginormous turtle with a shell diameter approaching two meters and heads the size of a soccer ball. So th these are huge, like leatherbacks, basically, um, or slightly smaller. This, then there, we found two individuals of this at this site. And then E represents some uh, armored plates of, of the alligator Dinosuchus which we found a nearly complete specimen of associated with gastrolis, which I'll show you, show you in a second, stomach stones. And then F is a, um, a range of sizes of just Tyrannosaur toes that we, I put in there to give you an idea of the size range of the individuals of Tyrannosaurus. So we're up to five individuals now based on a minimum number of individual analysis. Um, one of them's a teeny tiny baby and the, the biggest one is a full somatic adult. Uh, approaching 10 meters in length. So uh, quite quite uh, a diverse and impressive assemblage. These are a sample of some of the dozens of gastrolists that we found directly associated with the Dinosuchus specimen. In fact, they're less than a meter away from what would be the dorsal area, you know, the, the, the rib cage area of this Dinosuchus. 
And so um, almost certainly represent gastrolis or stomach stones out of the Dinosuchus, which is largely complete. Um, and maybe indicating that there wasn't a whole lot of transport, even if there was some minor movement of the bones, these gastrolis probably wouldn't have moved very far. So at, at, at a site, finally, Raoul Martin's famous Dinosuchus trying to eat a Tyrannosaur comes to life. We actually have a site where we can put both these animals at the same place. I think that's pretty cool. <clears throat> well, how do we know which Tyrannosaurs these were? I mean, there's only one named Tyrannosaur from the Caparowitz, and that's Teratophonius curiae. Um, and so we did some comparisons uh, based on, well, we've got multiple skulls, and this is the largest individual. So this is the full somatic adult, fully grown, uh, meter long skull. And there's some key features in the post orbital, in the tooth count, which is 13 in the maxilla, and also the shape of the, uh, the lacrimal, which is slightly displaced out of the animal's face off to the right there, um, that uh, indicate this is probably teratophonius. I can't be definitive about whether it's curiae or something else, but at this point, I'm, I'm going to call it teratophonius, um, CF curiae or SPA. Um, and you can see that uh, this articulated skull indicates, again, there probably was an extensive transport or something like this would have probably broken up. I also want you to note that that skull even though it's articulated, is filled with a spider web of cracks. There are just cracks everywhere. And this will come up later in my talk. Okay, moving along uh, from the diversity of this site, let's talk about hydrodynamics and how the presence or absence of certain elements may give us a clue as to how extensive the water transport of these elements may have been. Our gut feeling was that they hadn't moved very far, but we wanted some scientific data to show that. If you look at the various parts of an animal's anatomy, it turns out that different parts have different responses to being transported by fluids. Some are more readily transported, others less so. And this was noted a long time ago um, and the elements in animals' bodies are given classifications based on their tendency to either travel readily under fluid transport or to sort of lag behind. And these um, are then referred to as Voorhees groups. And there are three Voorhees groups. And I have photos of Tyrannosaur elements from each Voorhees group at rainbows from a single size class. So these would all be elements from the, an individual in the same size class. So we're not comparing, you know, apples to oranges with juveniles and full adults. This is sort of a sub-adult, large juvenile size class. And we've got good representation in all three Voorhees groups of this medium-sized Tyrannosaur, which indicates there hasn't been very much transport. I mean, there's been a little winnowing maybe and some minor traction transport, but pretty much everything it, that you would expect to find from a complete individual is represented. And that's reinforced by an element count that we did, a frequency, um, uh, element frequency analysis that we did. So we just plotted all the identified Tyrannosaur elements, which would represent a fairly random sample and, uh, and then plotted them against the element count in a complete T-Rex skeleton. And as you can see, the curves are fairly similar. And that's evidence that we haven't selectively removed anything out of the fossil sample from the rainbows and unicorns quarry. You just randomly sample and you come up with an element distribution that's very close to what you would expect if you just killed a T-Rex and pulled all the bones apart and analyze them. So again, strong indication that there has not been much fluid transport of these Tyrannosaur elements at the rainbow site. Some, right, we know they, they've traveled some, but not far enough to start differentiating them out by Voorhees groups or, or class. All right, moving along from the hydrologic analysis, Let's talk about stable isotopes and what those can tell us about the site. 
So stable isotopes, um, in, in particular, uh, isotopes of oxygen and carbon can give us clues as to the environment, the temperatures, uh, organic activity, uh, and also the chemistry of the water. So in particular, it can tell you how fresh or how saline the water was, uh, where your waters are derived, whether they're out of the groundwater or whether they're from surface runoff high in the mountains, these sorts of things. So analysis of the stable isotopes can tell you whether or not these animals lived in different environments or if their signature, the environmental signature found within them is all the same. And the same can go for uh, analysis of the carbonates, which we did. Did these carbonate pebbles that we see both in the uh, unit three, as well as in the overlying uh, top sequence, are, are they, they similar chemically or stable isotope wise? So that's a sampling of stable isotopes in the unit three micrites or fine grain carbonates. And I was told by Selena and Daigo that that's essentially the same. You know, within reason, a spread between minus eight and minus seven is a single fingerprint, that these are all related to the same event, which is fine, right? You, you, you would expect all of the little white blobs in unit three to sort of represent the same event. It gets a little fuzzier data-wise when you start looking at um, fracture fills in, uh, in, in, in the little white balls because there's a different kind of calcite in there. It's not white and punky and chalky looking and fine grain, it's bigger crystals. And that probably represents a later event, maybe even much later kind of uh, recrystallization and maybe addition of some contaminants from the modern time. So that spreads the signal out. But if you just look at the original balls themselves, they're pretty tightly clustered. When you look at the balls that we found eroded into the overlying sequence and associated with the bones, they are actually slightly different carbon wise, um, but the oxygen signature is identical. It, it almost falls in between the two end members of the oxygen isotope signature of the carbonate balls. So, so again, Selena was fairly certain that the genetic you know, the origins of these white balls, both in the underlying unit and in the overlying unit associated with the bones, was similar. Why the lighter carbon? Well, I'll show you in just a second. Um, looking at the carbon or the sorry, the oxygen isotope signature in the turtle shells, within reason, they're all the same, with one exception. So aspiderotoides is one of our soft shells. We have um, another soft shell, um, uh, Gilmoramese gettysferensis, uh, the bayonid, which would be um, denizenomese, and then uh, neuronchylus, another bayonid. The, these average oxygen isotope signatures are essentially all the same. So um, we could fingerprint those animals all to a similar setting, similar environmental conditions, probably the same site. Can't be 100% sure, but it's looking pretty good for our argument. They all lived in the same lake. The one outlier is our giant sea turtle-like animal here on the far right. And that thing uh, shows a slightly heavier signature, um, which would suggest there may it may have lived downriver that, that didn't normally inhabit this lake, that it may have actually lived downriver most of the time, closer to the ocean where you'd expect the the oxygen, uh, con oxygen heavy isotope content to be slightly higher because it goes up as you go towards the ocean. Um, so how do you get the lighter carbon and yet a similar uh, oxygen signature? Well, it turns out that biological activity, especially um, aeration through tree roots and all the metabolic stuff that, that plants are doing down uh, among their roots, can actually deplete the carbon. And so, um, you know, you're probably looking at the nodules that have the higher, heavier carbon signature forming higher in a soil profile. So the groundwater that's forming the carbonates all the same. And so the oxygen is the same, but 
trees are affecting the the CO2 in the in the soil, and it's getting heavier as you get towards the surface. And so, you would you would expect to see a slightly heavier carbon signature uh, as you go towards the surface. So, indicating the pebbles in the unit with all the bones just represented a higher stratigraphic layer or a slightly higher, you know, um, part of the underlying sequence that got eroded. It all made sense to us. Now, we undertook a rare earth element analysis because we had so many objections from reviewers saying, you still can't prove these bones all came from the same site associated with each other in the same context. And we thought, well, maybe rare earths will tell us that because rare earths can actually act as a, a fingerprint for the very specific point of origin for a bone. Um, they've actually used rare earth element signatures and bones to prosecute criminal cases because they can be so diagnostic or unique to each particular site. So when we ran the uh, rare earth uh, lanthanide series analysis, it turns out that there's a similar pattern in everything we ran. Kind of um, heavy on the light elements and light on the heavies. And it turns out that particular signature where you're, you know, kind of light on ytterbium, lutetium, erbium, holmium, and heavy on cerium and praseodymium and neodymium and all that, it, it turns out that's, that indicates a very specific set of environmental conditions. In particular, quiet water floodplain settings. If, this, the, if any of these elements had had an origin in a, in a channel, it would be inversed. You would expect to be depleted in the lights and enriched in the heavies. So the signature of every element in the carbonate pebbles themselves were all indicative of an origin on a flood plain and all within the same basic context. I mean, they were so similar that um, Dr. Suarez was absolutely sure that these things originated out of the same spot, okay? And that was sort of our silver bullet for the argument that these were all derived locally from the same spot. Nothing was being washed in from far away. So um, when we took a look at the charcoal and, uh, you know, with, with bearing in mind that we thought maybe this could be the smoking gun, literally, <laughs> uh, for our Tyrannosaur deaths, uh, it turns out all the wood was conifer. There, you know, there was all probably uh, variations of redwoods and podocarps. Some of it had extensive fungal rot in it. And so you're, you're seeing some evidence of that fungal rot in, for instance, pictures uh, seven and uh, let's see, in four, where, you know, fungal hyphae, little roots of fungus have gotten into the wood and attacked it and caused it to rot. So that wood was already dead and down by the time the fire burned it. Um, and when we looked at something called the reflectance of the charcoal, it was all indica indicative of a low temperature fire. So we're looking at a fire that, um, you know, sort of smoldered through an area. It wasn't a really high temperature crown fire that are associated with mass mortalities. This is, a, this is the sort of smoldering fire that a Tyrannosaur could have easily walked away from. All right, moving on from the charcoal. So, so we've kind of eliminated the fire as, a, as an agent of mass mortality, but it may come in handy later to explain how we got the deposit ultimately. So looking at bone weathering, how long had these bones been sitting around before they finally got washed into their final resting place and uh, preserved as fossils? Well, the, this the taphonomic grade, or basically the, uh, the quality or the pristine nature of the bone was very high. Very little of the material at the site from any of the species showed extensive weathering, indicating that it, these animals um, died 
had a very brief history at the surface and were buried and uh, escaped the ravages of either soil weathering or um, you know, scavenging or rot or anything like that. So these bones are pristine. Their outside surfaces are beautiful. <clears throat> and yet, that contrasts with this pervasive fracturing that we saw in virtually every bone at the site. You remember the skull, how shattered it looked? Well, A is a, uh, a juvenile femur from the site, and it's just hammered. I mean, these things are, are shot through with spider webs of fractures. Um, when you do shape analysis on the fractures, they're rectangular, so they indicate they didn't happen when the animal was, uh, or when the bones were still green or wet or uh, fresh. They, they actually form more of a rectangular pacture, pattern, which we call a dry fracture, indicating most of the meat and and uh, guts and soft tissue had been removed and it was just more or less a mineral matrix that was breaking. But we even saw tooth crowns shattered in this fashion, which was puzzling because that rarely happens. So how do you explain that? Well, it turns out that if you wet and dry um, these fossil for, uh, bones repeatedly, they start to shrink and swell on their own. All you have to do is wet and dry them repeatedly over and over again. And if you did that in a subterranean or, or buried environment, they could still maintain their pristine sort of outside surfaces and yet develop all these longitudinal cracks within them. So we think that this pattern of rectangular fracturing actually resulted not from surface exposure and weathering, but from repeated wet dry cycles while they resided in the soil uh, after the lake dried out, after they'd long been buried in that initial uh, burial. And then of course, when they were exhumed and reburied, they failed catastrophically mechanically because they'd been filled with all these weaknesses while they were lying in that, uh, that soil horizon. Okay, so I'm gonna sum up here what we have hard evidence for. Um, one is tyrannosaurs were initially buried in a quiet slack water in, uh, environment like a lake uh, associated with giant alligators, large fish. Um, I didn't mention we have uh, several other kinds of fish, but notably bowfins, gars, a um, uh, chunk of sturgeon, and then other like smaller teleos. These really large turtles. Um, we see the vestigial fine grain sediments in the bone pores of the tyrannosaur material indicating that they were initially buried in a fine grain setting, perfect. Isotopes indicate that the turtles and fish uh, all inhabited the same eco space, but uh, tyrannosaurs had a different signature because they were probably, they weren't living in the lake, they were wandering in from somewhere else. The Voorhees groups indicate that there was minimal transport as well as our, um, our um, element frequency analysis, very little transport to almost no, I mean, it, it, there was some minor movement, but it was meters rather than hundreds of meters. Um, and the association with gastrolis would support that. The tyrannosaur material uh, all seemed to be at the similar stage of weathering, indicating that they all came to rest in the same place at a, about the same time. And that uh, the turtles and gastropods found at unit three can be directly connected to turtle shell fragments and gastropods that we find in the overlying unit with all the bones. So there's a good tie between the upper and lower sequences indicating that all the bones in the upper sequence were actually derived locally right there from the lower sequence. I hope I've made that case. Um, we have five different growth stages uh, of tyrannosaurs at the site from very young to a full somatic adult approaching, uh, well, I calculate it was 29 and a half feet, almost 30 feet. Most of the fossils experienced rapid burial, mild pedogenesis, and then repeated wet dry cycles, which both filled them with the pedogenic calcium carbonate, as well as creating orthogonal fracture patterns that uh, <clears throat> weren't accompanied by uh, surface weathering or erosion, which you would expect if they'd been sitting on the surface. The bulk of the fossils at the site were actually winnowed out of the lower sequence and then buried in a fluvial or river channel deposit, which 
when the compacting of the new burial occurred in the sand bars um, triggered the mechanical failure of the elements essentially in situ where they were being buried. So that's why we see the pervasive fracture patterns, but they're not shattered and scattered. Uh, and that this occurred in a current that was moving along at about an orientation of 314 degrees. And that sometime after that, you had a low temperature fire uh, between the deposition of units three and the overlying sequence. So the fire, we don't know exactly when it occurred, but we have a best guess. Um, so let's talk about attritional versus mass mortality because this becomes important to our questions of gregariousness and social behavior in tyrannosaurs. Um, if you look at uh, the similar, you know, attritional Oh, I got these. Uh, I got these backwards here on the first point. So attritional versus mass mortality. If you look at uh, a, a setting in which you're accumulating individuals over time rather than all at the same time, you would expect the bone weathering to be at different stages. So, excuse me, and in, invert those top two. Um, and if you had a mass mortality, you would expect the bone weathering to all be at the sort of similar stage because they were buried together and experienced the exact same history together. Uh, attritionals can be age selective, like, um, you know, you see it, uh, mammoth hot springs, all the dumb young males all wander off and fall into a sinkhole. Um, Myers can be age selective because the small ones get stuck uh, and the adults are able to struggle free. Um, and then finally, uh, trapping mechanisms are usually have some physical signature at the site, such as a quicksand, a mire, a sinkhole, evidence for something that could become a trapping mechanism. Um, when you're talking about mass mortalities like fire or flood, um, they're generally not as age selective. And you're talking about a very short time span with, with a catastrophic event. And we think that the, uh, the evidence in total supports a, a mass mortality rather than an attritional accumulation of tyrannosaurs. This is a mass mortality from Queensland, Australia, where you had fires followed by floods. Um, and we can envision a very similar fate for our tyrannosaurs. Uh, these guys are high and dry, but of course the tyrannosaurs, it looked like actually floated down into a, a lake basin or a, uh, a meander in a river more like this. So this is a little dry channel in Queensland and you can see on the right side, there's a, there's a little channel running through the right side there and the, the um, dead car carcasses are accumulating along the banks of this channel as the floodwaters sort of slack and recede. And then the, you can see the fence on the bottom center also acted as a trap for the flowing waters. But the ones in the center of the picture are actually just accumulating on bars um, as floodwaters recede. I can easily see something like this happening at rainbows. So in summary, the first event is you have this happy lake filled with fish and turtles, <clears throat> and then a seasonal flood event, which creates some very unhappy tyrannosaurs that end up in the lake, drowned. Later on, this lake dries out, the former lake is colonized by plants. We see evidence of the roots penetrating and you can start to see as the water table retreats, you can create uh, these incipient or, or initial carbonates down near the sea horizon, these little caliches. Subsequently, um, as things maybe continued to dry out, um, you had a fire. You had a, you had a forest die off and then a smoldering fire move through. But as you notice, the tyrannosaurs are long dead. The fire had nothing to do with killing them. Now, what it could have been responsible for was exhuming them and reburying them because landscapes are frequently made unstable after fires. You get high erosion, you can get avulsions or changing in river courses um, because of log jams and uh, you know debris flows and things after you burn a landscape bare of its vegetation. And we didn't find any leaves or conifer needles at the site, suggesting that maybe during the redeposition, the landscape was fairly barren of vegetation. So the last event then would be for this river channel nearby 
to uh, change course following the fire, exhume uh, all the material in the former lake and over near the margin of the channel where the currents weren't quite so swift, uh, you, you had actual winnowing and minor transport of these elements in the rainbow site. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, when you compare the basic signatures of rainbows and unicorns with the dry, Al dry island Alberta source site, they're very similar. You see flood kills, large body of water, and at uh, dry island, you had a flood kill into a forest. Um, Multi-generational kill, same at dry island. Multi-generational kill. At rainbows, you had reworking with minimal transport. Again, dry island, Albertosaurus, reworking with mineral transport. So the basic site hit histories are the same with the um, major difference being rainbows, the bodies ended up into a lake, whereas in dry island, they ended up in a sort of forested setting adjacent to a, a channel. So dry islands up there, we now have evidence of a what I am claiming is a Tyrannosaur mass mortality down in the southern U.S., the first of its kind, and also representing a completely different family of Tyrannosaurs than the Albertosaurus that we find up in Canada. Um, rainbows would be slightly older. And then there also is another Tyrannosaur mass mortality site that I don't have enough details to talk about um, <clears throat> you know, it, it explicitly, but may also have some similarities to rainbows and dry island, which is the type Dasplitosaurus horneri type locality, which would be slightly younger than rainbows. So there's this emerging pattern of Tyrannosaur mass mortalities in the Western interior. Hey, disclaimer, we're, we're getting into wild speculation now. You cannot, you cannot prove um, behavior very easily from the fossil record as I've been reminded over and over again by our reviewers. <laughs> But first of all, let's consider the overall rarity of tyrannosaurs. You know, they're rare. So to find big groups of them buried together in catastrophic events would suggest that this may reflect behavior rather than just statistical improbabilities occurring over and over again. Um, secondly, there is now finally uh, track evidence up in British Columbia from the Wapiti Formation um, it, it, that Tyrannosaurs could potentially have been gregarious. We see a set of three different tracks or trackways made by um, an Albertosaurus-like animal walking through a uh, muddy floodplain situation. And uh, it, it's hard not to argue that this represents at least gregarious behavior or, or grouping. There's a track map of the track sites. You have three individual Albertosaurine type Tyrannosaurs walking in the same direction through the same, and then an or, maybe a little Ornithomimid or some other small theropod track going the other direction. He's like, I'm getting out of here. So when you look at gregarious behavior, you're talking about habitual gathering for breeding or feeding, um, no casts or roles within the group. They can be seasonal or intermittent not strictly hierarchical and frequently they're age selective. So you have all breeding adults gathering at a rookery to, to breed and raise young, but it's a seasonal activity and there's certainly no hierarchy involved. You have opportunistic feeding gatherings or groups of crocodiles gathering on the banks of rivers, um, but it's not a hierarchical uh, parasocial or organized group. Um, whereas there's parasocial, now, two social is something altogether different. I'm not going to get into that. But parasocial are essentially permanent groups that form for to increase the probability of hunting or defensive success. These represent, um, you know, definite casts or roles within the group. They're they're permanent and uh, tend to be hierarchical and not age selective. You have everything from the young to the old represented in the group. Oops. So when you look at the age spread of the individuals at rainbows um, from about five years all the way up to 20 plus, uh, it, it looks more like you could be 
a, a, a long-term sort of parasocial group rather than a sort of gregarious opportunistic gathering. And now we're seeing that potential exhibited both in the Albertosaurus lineage and in the more advanced uh, Teratophonius lineage in the South. So that's starting to suggest that this potential parasocial or advanced gregarious nature of these animals was not just within a single group, but sort of pervasive among Tyrannosaurids uh, in Laramidia, in, in North America at the time. Why so? Well, uh, Tyrannosaurs are members of the Silurosauria, and one of the defining characters of the Silurosauria is that they have an enlarged brain. Why did they need a larger brain? Is it possible that these, uh, these behaviors sort of co-evolved with the enlarged brain? And to those who argue that, uh, you know, Silurosaurus didn't have the brain power to be social or um, parasocial animals. It's sort of like uh, wolves. There's this example of the modern Harris hawk here shown group hunting in the Sonoran Desert. And these are incredibly sophisticated uh, raptors that will hunt uh, in groups up to six, eight individuals. They'll form perimeters with sentries. They'll send uh, a sort of scout down to flush prey, and then they'll take turns hammering the prey and bring down things two, three, four, five times their own body weight, like jackrabbits, um, doing this highly sophisticated, coordinated hunting. Now, the, the species doesn't do it everywhere, but here's at least one example of a salurosaur that's involved in highly complex parasocial behavior. So in summary, rainbows, tyrannosaurs, they died together in a single event, i.e. Uh, via flood kill. That the rainbow site is remarkably similar to the dry island site, and I would add tentatively to the Daspletosaurus horneri site, the other described tyrannosaur mass mortality in the literature. That this gregarious behavior at a minimum, it was gregarious and that it was pervasive in the Tyrannosaurids of Laramidia or of uh, Western North America. And that the age disparity within all of the, or, or at least the dry island and rainbow sites suggests that there may be a more complex social relationship than just gregariousness. So with that, I'll leave you with pondering whether these groups could behave as a pack as Phil Curry has so vocally advocated for. So are we looking at this or this? Okay, that's all I have. Um, special thanks to Harry Barber, the Prior River District Manager, the BLM. Um, I uh, wanna give a shout out to any BLM who might be watching tonight. I think our state director may be on and Anita, the associate. So. Um, hello to all of you and, and thanks for your support. Um, I do want to also thank the Natural History Museum of Utah, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and all others that have been involved in our work, um, our volunteers and uh, support in the past from Grand Staircase Escalante Partners. Thank you very much.